What do you practice? How do you know what to practice? Do you practice something different every day? I wanna just start with a few sort of best practices uh, that come from the tradition of Buddhism, which is what I practice and study and whatnot. And then I, I wanna share a few other little tips for getting some extra time in, in like a modern setting, because <laughs> I think for most of us, just finding the time to meditate is probably the biggest challenge. Uh, Dave says no spreadsheets, correct, no spreadsheets. Although I did make up a, a little like weekly um, tracker planner kind of a document. I'm probably gonna end up sending that out to everybody who's on my email list, but no pressure. This is really more to think about how do you, how do you know what you wanna work on? Here are a few tips from the Buddhist tradition about how to, how to time your meditation, um, how to kind of structure a practice so that it's as helpful as possible to you. And the first one is to try to do your meditation regularly. And when I say regularly, I don't mean like you have to do it every day. I'm just saying, you know, same approximate time, same approximate place can be really helpful for your body and your mind just automatically settling when you start to meditate. So for instance, you can probably see um, over my shoulder here, I have my little like shrine and meditation area. And for me, I like to do my meditation first thing in the morning. I'll say more about how I structure my practice after these, you know, sort of best practices things. I wanna hear about how y'all structure your practices too. Hello, Hazard in London. Hello, hello, welcome. <clears throat> um, but the more you can have like a dedicated place for your practice and a dedicated time for your practice, the easier it makes it to just settle in. And I recognize maybe not everybody has a little piece of, you know, your living space that you can dedicate just to your meditation area. Uh, but for instance, I had like a really small apartment one time and I did my meditation in the closet. <laughs> I would just have like my little cushion set up. You know, you can, you can scoot them out of the way when you're done, but just to have like a consistent place that you're going to come in and do your practice can be really helpful. The other thing is there are two times of day that are really recommended for um, doing your meditation practice, traditionally speaking, and that's morning and evening. So like first thing in the morning and last thing at night. And in both cases, there's just an element of like pragmatism to it. Like first thing in the morning, you haven't gotten involved with like all the stuff that you're going to be working on during the day or doing or involved in. So your mind is a little bit more clear. There's fewer thoughts just naturally coming up. So that's one really nice time to do your meditation. I would imagine everybody has heard that advice before, but I'm just saying it in case it's new to you. And the other time that's nice for doing your meditation practice is last thing at night. And I know that like sleep meditations are super popular. I think, I think sleep is something, especially with the whole pandemic and just all the stressful stuff that goes on in life. Um, meditating last thing at night can be a really nice thing to help you ease into sleep. I do just want to say you don't want to train yourself to fall asleep as you meditate though. If you really, if you start to concretize that link between meditation and falling asleep, then anytime you're going to meditate, you are having to fight against that, that like tendency to just fall asleep. So I just want to say, we all know that meditation can lead us into states of relaxation, calmness, peace, etc. That doesn't mean falling asleep. Like in meditation, you want to balance that relaxation with alertness. So if you're going to meditate last thing at night, if you're doing a sleep meditation and that's your intention, then like perfect. If that's a great way to fall asleep. But if you're only formal meditation practice in the day is when you're lying down in bed last thing at night and you're kind of hoping to fall asleep, I would say maybe try and find some place or find a little time in your schedule that is not last thing at night to do a little, a little practice that's not going to lead you into sleep. Dave says, how about a standing meditation late in the day? Yes, perfect. Standing meditation is a great... It, people don't talk about standing meditation 
nearly as much as I think maybe they should or could. But standing meditation is a great way to just be in a different posture. Like me, I sit in a desk, at a desk, behind a computer most of the day. So I like to take little meditation breaks where I stand up. It's a great time to focus on body awareness. You can do breath awareness. You can do some intentional breathing exercises or qigong. So I wanna talk about that later, but yeah, Dave, I love that idea. <laughs> Logan says, I used to do walking meditation in the evenings to prevent passing out. Also a great idea. Anything involving movement, involving standing up, that's a great way to do some practice at night. And also, even if you're not meditating at night intentionally to fall asleep, there can be a lot of uh, positive outcomes in terms of, you know, falling asleep more quickly by meditating, even if you're meditating in the morning, you know, like better sleep quality is one of the benefits that people often report when they meditate. Dave says, big consequences if I nod off while standing. Exactly, exactly. The brain is not just going to be like, Psh, it's no big deal. We can like nod off a little bit. Um, <laughs> funny story. <laughs> Speaking of nodding off and consequences, um, I spent a while in a monastery in Northeast Thailand one time called Wat Pa Nanachat. Totally amazing monastery. Um, it's in the Thai forest tradition. So like real renunciation, real emphasis on practice. So cool. Um, and what they would do is every like quarter phase of the moon. So about every week, they would have this uh, big like practice day, basically, when a lot of the people from the surrounding villages would come in and just for one day, you know, they would do a lot of meditation. They would listen to Dharma talks. But part of what they did was uh, they would meditate all night long. So all of us who were staying at the monastery, I wasn't a nun or anything. I wasn't ordained. I was just staying there as a lay person. But all of us were expected to come and do the all night sit. And uh, so I was sitting cross-legged. But I remember at one point in the middle of the night, I was just so tired. I was like, I'm going to just rest my head on my knee right quick. And I totally fell asleep. Like cross-legged, head on knee passed out. So that was embarrassing. Um, but yes, if you do standing meditation <laughs> last thing at night, you're pretty likely not to fall asleep. Consequences will be much larger. Um, so I guess even talking about, <laughs> Dave says, wake up with a crick in the neck. Yeah, I would have expected to be really sore. I'm not like super, super flexible, but surprisingly, probably because I was asleep, I was not actually sore when I woke up. So I guess the body can just relax more fully when you're asleep. So we've just talked a little bit about times of day to do different types of meditation. I think it's really interesting that different postures for meditation have already come up in our conversation and it kind of provides a bridge to the next thing I want to talk about, which is... Hello friends, I hope you enjoy this short video on how to get more meditation time in your daily life. And if you're interested in watching the full video that I trimmed this out of, or if you'd like to get my free uh, course on the Four Noble Truths, just see the info box below. Ways of working meditation into daily life. I think this one is really important for those of us who have a busy schedule, who love to meditate, but we just can't seem to find enough time. Um, one thing I like to do is to use the Pomodoro timer. I'll put this in the chat. Pomodoro evidently just means tomato <laughs> in Italian. Um, but it's a timer system where you work 25 minutes and then you take a five minute break. And every four Pomodoro chunks, so that's about every two hours, you take a 15 minute break. So I recognize not everybody necessarily has like the flexibility with your job to be able to, to work to that kind of schedule. But if you do, then, I mean, if you're working from home, if you're behind a computer all day, it's so helpful to take these little breaks. Um, and, you know, I probably get an extra, at least 20 to 30 minutes of meditation a lot of days, just as part of my daily routine, you know? So if you're looking for a way to fold some extra meditation time in, that time can be walking meditation. That time can be standing meditation. That time could be qigong. That time could be doing a few yoga stretches. Anything that's gonna help 
energize your mind and your body is going to be great for productivity, but at the same time, it's also going to get you some mindfulness, some meditation, just some time to return to your body during the day. So I highly recommend that both in terms of productivity and also in terms of getting some meditation time during the day. Dave says, Claire, how long are your meditation breaks during the day? Say five minutes. Yeah. So like I just explained, you know, I'll work 25 minutes and then I'll take five minutes off. And what I like to do is to actually like turn away from my computer, get up and look out the window, maybe, you know, do some stretching or some mindful movement. Uh, it's just five minutes, but it can have a really big impact on my state of mind and how fresh my mind feels, like whether or not I'm kind of running out of juice, mentally speaking. And then there is that 15 minute longer break. So if you want a longer meditation session, you're probably going to get at least a couple of those in a work day. So you can take maybe just one 15 minute break and have a longer meditation um, and, and not be trying to carve time out of, you know, your time with family or friends or, you know, exercising, whatever else you need to do in the day. So those are, that's just an idea um, one idea about how to fold some extra meditation time in, you know, somebody mentioned on a call recently, taking any time you have standing in line, waiting for something to happen, you know, we get these little chunks of time during a given day. And often it's super tempting to just like jump on your phone. But if instead you really try and reclaim those little chunks of time, again, they add up, you know, you might think like 30 seconds it's just too small to even try to do any practice. You can take three deep breaths, you know, bring the attention back to the body and settle the energy down to the, to the center of the abdomen, this very like deep grounded place in the body. So I just want to, I just want to like summarize this section by saying never underestimate the power of taking these tiny little meditation breaks during the day because they can have a big impact. Yeah, Logan says, I do five minute meditation between my stops at work. And if I know I'm going to do a stressful stop, I'll also do a round of mantras with my mala. That is so good. Um, you know, mantras kind of touches into the whole idea of calling on what's sacred, calling on what's bigger than we are. And I know everyone probably has a different sense of what the sacred is, whether for you it's, you know, Buddha or the Dalai Lama or Jesus or the Blessed Virgin Mary or, you know, saints or like nature itself. So whatever the sacred is for you, taking a little break and just trying to connect with that, whether it's through prayer, mantra recitation, um, just reflecting on the interconnectedness of the universe. There's a lot of different ways of contacting that and it can be a really powerful like support for your practice. So thanks, Logan. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's good to have like someone other than me <laughs> saying like, this is what I do. And, it, and it's really helpful. <clears throat> okay, so that was a lot of stuff. Um, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. I'm going to shift over and talk about the way I structure my meditation practice. I want to talk about daily and I also want to talk longer term. Um, so I'd love for you to drop a question or a comment in the chat and just, you know, share with everybody what your best practices are. You know, Logan mentioned taking the five minute break between stops, um, doing mala meditation. Dave has talked about, you know, doing standing meditation at night. What are your best practices and, you know, what do you think has helped you to create a, an, an ongoing meditation practice. So please drop that in the chat while you're writing. I'll share my experience and hopefully we'll have some other people's experiences too to share. If you're watching this later, I, I'm recording it. I'll be sharing it on, on YouTube and as a podcast. So if you're watching this later and you have a best practice to share, please drop it in the comments because people can still see those and still get benefit. So for me personally, the way I structure my daily practice is I start out doing the um, foundational practices of Tibetan Buddhism. So this is like a whole set of practices where you 
reflect on impermanence, you reflect on how precious your human life is, you take refuge, you generate what's called bodhicitta, the intention to awaken to be of benefit to all beings. And there's some other like specific, very short practices that are, that are foundational to Tibetan Buddhism that you would do in the course of, of doing Nundro foundation practices. So that takes about 30 minutes. Um, and I like to do it like before breakfast, you know, first thing. When I have the time and when I don't have a whole lot of stuff on my schedule, I might then do like 15 minutes of just silent meditation or um, do a practice. Uh, so in Tibetan Buddhism, we have all these different practices like Tara, the Buddha of compassion, Avalokiteshvara, another Buddha of compassion, um, just so many different ways of connecting with the sacred. So I might do one of those practices um, and then Obviously, I have breakfast, I get dressed, etc. Um, but then during my work day, I also like to take these little breaks that I mentioned. So, you know, just five minutes. Um, I really like to move around because I'm mostly seated when I'm working. So I might uh, try and take those five minutes and do a little bit of Qigong or even just like stretch, you know, just do something seated if I am not going to stand up and move around too much. Ursula says, I'm doing a reading of Buddhist teachings, which gives me input for meditation. Yeah, yeah. Um, having, you know, five minutes and you read a verse from a text and you like reflect on it and have time to take that in can be a really nice way to use break times during your day um, or just, you know, these little short meditation times during your day. So, um, yeah, so for me, like as I go through the day, I do try to get off my screen, take breaks. Um, I try to get movement. And if it's a day when I didn't have a lot of time before I got started, I will try to take those five minute breaks and the 15 minute break and just do maybe silent meditation or um, maybe like listen to a short track on Insight Timer. Like my record of like consecutive days on insight timer is actually not very good because I often will do foundational practices and then I'll space my meditation out with my five minute like timer sessions. So like I never end up like officially meditating on insight timer. Um, so if anyone is trying to like maintain their streak on insight timer, uh, you might, you might like track your five minutes um, on the app. You can also find a lot of really great short guided meditations on that app. So if you, you know, if your mind is zooming around and it's going to be easier to do a guided meditation than like a silent one, I recommend getting on the app. There's, you know, there's a really nice, I think it was Joski in um, Buddhist Wisdom Modern Life who shared this track, but there's a really nice uh, seven minute track of just somebody singing the Tara mantra. So it's the mantra of the Buddha of compassion. She's green, she's swift, she's responsive. She's related to the air element for those who were on um, my talk here yesterday. So that's just a really nice break for your brain. Um, <laughs> Dave says, always after more IT starts. <laughs> oh, stats, joking, ignore my stats. <laughs> oh, his stars, his stars, yeah. Um, Logan says, I enjoy the Guru Rinpoche chant in Insight Timer. Yeah, Guru Rinpoche, man, he's like, I don't know if you can see on my shrine back here, but actually, no, I don't think you can, but I have a little statue of, in, of uh, Guru Rinpoche. It's very like... Uh, central to the form of Tibetan Buddhism that I practice. So yeah, anything that helps you connect to the sacred, to nature as a whole, um, all of that is really good for these like small breaks during the day. Ursula says, when doing a walk alone, I often repeat mantras. Yes, I like to do mantras when I'm driving too. I think mantras are just great anytime really, um, but yeah, any activity that you want to like infuse with compassion or wisdom or sort of like fierce compassion, all of those times are, are great for doing mantras. 
And also, I mean, I've been talking about these more complicated forms of meditation like mantras or qigong. You can always also just sit, be with your breath, feel that flow. Um, oh, Deanna says, what's an example of a mantra? Well, I'll write two of them. Um, so the one I just wrote is Tara's mantra, Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Soha. And um, like I said, you can find people like singing the mantra, chanting the mantra on Insight Timer. Um, basically, when you sing that mantra, it's it like evokes the energy of this green female Buddha of compassion. She's quick to respond, and she her like traditional sort of superpower is to clear away fear. I like to, to sing her mantra when I'm feeling anxiety. I don't usually feel, you know, like fear of elephants or fear of snakes, which is like two of the things she traditionally helps to fight. But I feel anxiety. I worry about whether I'm going to get stuff done, what's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. Just, you know, all the, all the stuff happening in the world right now, her mantra is really great for that. Um, Dave and Logan, I'm going to get to y'all's comments in a second. Yeah, Logan actually mentioned the other one I was going to write... which is Om Mani Peme Hong. Um, <clears throat> this is the mantra of the male Buddha of compassion. He's like white colored, um, not like a white person, but like, like a blank piece of paper. And uh, he's very associated with the Dalai Lamas. So like you can imagine it's just the loving, compassionate energy of the Dalai Lama kind of coming through you or, or responding as you say that mantra. Um, yeah, Stephanie says pause has a great green Tara mantra on Insight Timer. That might be the one I mentioned. There's a ton of Omani Pemi Hung um, tracks on Insight Timer too. If you just search for mantras, you'll find a lot of them, but it is kind of nice to know like whose mantra you're singing. Um, so maybe just, you know, Google the different the different folks whose mantras you you could you could sing on Insight Timer. Dave says, when I'm driving in heavy traffic, I send metta to all those on the road, visualize metta from the exhaust. Weird, but works for me. Yes. I, uh, I used to live in Houston and I really do not like traffic. And I really don't like it when people drive super crazy in traffic. And I, again, I used mantras, but any form of loving kindness meditation you can use in traffic, I think is like fabulous because it can really just transform the experience of being in traffic from being like ah, I just want to like move and get to where I'm going to being like we're all stuck in this together you know the people driving crazy how stressed out are they maybe they have a really important interview or something that they're trying to get to you know how painful is that so it can if you can if you can turn on that loving kindness meditation in those times you can really use those to, to, you know, to transform the way you meet your life, which is awesome. Logan says, Omni Pei Hong is my go-to while at work. Uh, yes, that is a fabulous mantra. You cannot go wrong with it. Um, if you have like beads that you wear, whether they're decorative or not, these for me are purely decorative. I don't use them to accumulate mantras or anything, but it's really nice to just like have a little like wrist thing that you can just, if somebody's really stressing you out, you can pull it out and just, you know, start counting some mantras. If you're on a video call, uh, all you have to do is this, your hands are down, nobody can see you. And you're just, you know, saying some mantras. You don't have to have any like physical prop to say mantras in your day, but I find it helps keep my attention kind of focused if I have a physical like thing to do with my hands. Okay, so that's kind of how do you structure your practice in one day? Like, how do you find time to meditate? Um, and, and what do you what do you meditate on? I, I think one of the questions that came up in um, the circle here on Insight Timer, uh, it's called Buddhist Wisdom Modern Life. I think uh, there's probably a lot of people who weren't on. The first time I entered that. So Buddhist was a modern life. It's the circle that I'm part of on Insight Timer. Uh, and this, this talk kind of came out of um, a conversation we had there. And I think one of the questions was like, how do you know, like when you sit down to meditate, 
how do you decide what you're going to meditate on? <laughs> um, should you do the same thing for the whole meditation session or should you change it up if you aren't feeling the one thing anymore? And, oh, Dave says, I put on Om Namah Shivaya by Donna Delory, the Lover and the Beloved album. Yeah, there's there's a ton of like devotional music um, on streaming services too. So if you find an artist you really like, uh, like, I'm really into Janet Stone's work. She is, the, the mantras she's singing are Hindu, but I mean, it's it's all sacred. So I like to listen to them. Um, so you can find, you know, albums, you can create an entire playlist for like a really stressful day when you're gonna need support all day long. Um, not that you really wanna listen to mantras all day long. I think it gets a little, a little old. Yeah, Janet Stone. Um, and for Logan, who's a fan of Guru Rinpoche, oh, I just blanked out on the name of this group, but there's some really great Guru Rinpoche songs too. I'm, as soon as I stop thinking about them, I'll remember. So I'll put them in the chat in the, um, in our circle when I like remember them. There's even a really cool bluegrass song about Guru Rinpoche. Anyway, it's awesome. There's a lot of resources out there. <laughs> Um, so in terms of deciding what you're going to practice in any given session, I think there's a balance. Like this would be my personal take on it. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, see how it works for you. But I think there's a balance between deciding what you want to practice and, and having the flexibility still to go in a different direction if that's what you're called to. So like, for instance, um, if you want to sit down and just cultivate calm abiding meditation, this is probably one of the things I do most often um, if I'm like doing a specific like skill during a session. I feel like calm abiding meditation is like my personal weak point. So I always want to strengthen it. Um, so if I'm going to sit down and just focus on, for instance, the flow of breath as my object of meditation or physical sensations in the center of the abdomen, as my object of meditation. Like, especially if you're trying to cultivate calm abiding meditation, just stick with that object, I think, it is my sense of things. Unless something really, you know, comes up, like you start experiencing a lot of anxiety or something that you weren't aware of was in there. If you start having that stuff come up, you can let that be your object of meditation. You can really feel it, allow it, be present to it. We've been talking a lot about different ways of bringing compassion into daily life, like mantras or, you know, uh, like Dave's idea of, of sending metta to everybody in a traffic jam. Give that metta meditation to yourself, you know? So if something really like a strong emotion or something like that comes up while you're trying to cultivate maybe mindfulness or calm abiding or something like more basic like that, I would say respond to what is happening. If it's something really strong, you're not going to be able to like to notice it and then it's just going to go away. Like let that be what guides your your meditation. Um, <laughs> Logan says, Shalmata um, is not, Shalmata is a roadblock. So I've been trying to focus on that for weeks. Um, is not... <laughs> I'm not exactly, I think I'm misreading your, your quote, but uh, yeah, shamatha is so important, which is calm abiding meditation. So, um, and, and the thing with shamatha in particular is you're really trying to focus on one object. You're trying to let your mind rest on that object. Um, oh yeah, Logan says, is a roadblock. Yeah, for me too, totally. Um, so if you're doing calm abiding meditation, and something comes up and you you switch to that object of meditation and something else comes up and you switch over there that's not calm abiding anymore you know now you're maybe cultivating mindfulness or some other really important skill but like if you're doing calm abiding like whatever's coming up you you notice it and you let it go you don't follow it but it can be really helpful to follow sometimes so if you have that strong emotion come up um, and you're able to be with it you're able to let it kind of run its course, I often find um, that's really helpful 
and, and after it's run its course, often I have like an interesting insight into, you know, some emotional thing that I tend to do. And maybe this explains why I do that, or maybe I've been able to kind of release that pattern a bit. So, and this is something that my, ugh, one of my teachers, Harvey Aronson, author of this wonderful book, Buddhist Practice on Western Ground. I'll put that in chat. Um, he actually has a whole chapter about this. It's called, um, like, I forget exactly the, the title of the chapter, but it's basically like Express and Local Trains. And what he's saying is, you know, traditionally, the teaching was, if you're doing calm abiding meditation, or really almost any type of meditation, and you have a thought or an emotion come up, you notice it and you let it go. And what Harvey is saying is like, we're, we're much more um, in this society oriented toward like therapy and getting insights into our personal behaviors and stuff like that. So it can be helpful, not, not every time you practice calm abiding, but like, yeah, you still need to like train that muscle, but it can be helpful if you have something strong coming up to actually make that your object of meditation. Um, so hopefully that's clear. I feel like I'm just starting to repeat myself now, but if you're interested, uh, this book by Harvey, Buddhist Practice on Western Ground, is really helpful, really good chapter on that. He is a psychotherapist and a Buddhist Lama. Logan says, yeah, thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, I find this book really helpful. So um, Logan says, I'll also check out the book. Excellent, excellent. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about was really more of like the long-term practice, you know? So when you start really calm abiding, mindfulness, the basic skills are the best thing to, to practice for a while. And if you do, which I recommend if this is a possibility for you, if you do a course, especially like live, whether it's online or in person, and there's a teacher and there's fellow students, that's a great way to start and to practice those skills with people and, and they should be taking you through a curriculum so that you're getting exposed to these skills and each week you know this is what I'm practicing. You know, maybe this week I'm practicing uh, the body scan meditation and the next week maybe you're practicing meditating on the breath. Whatever it is, you have someone who's helping you to structure that time. Um, if you don't though, or you know, if you're not a beginner anymore, and I think the, the sort of middle stage or, I don't know, middle intermediate skill level, I guess. You're not a beginner, but maybe it's still nice to have some structure to your practice. It can be nice, I think, um, you know, Ursula mentioned having a book that she reads that's inspiring. It can be nice to just take a, you know, a Dharma book. Um, personally, this is what happens when I sit by my bookshelf. Um, <laughs> I have been reading through Healing with Form, Energy, and Light by Denzel Wongiller and Pache. If you've come to any of my previous sessions for like the last month, you've probably heard me mention this book. Uh, if I put the title in chat. You know, it, it has chapters on the five elements. There are practices recommended in it. So it can be really helpful to just take a book and in your daily practice, you're putting into practice what you're learning in the book. And, you know, there's so many wonderful books by wonderful teachers. Pema Chodron comes to mind. She has books on what's called Tong Lin, uh, Meditation on Taking and Giving. It's a very powerful compassion meditation. Uh, so anyway, there's just a ton of different books and teachings and, and courses on Insight Timer on these different topics. And I have found it helpful personally to stay with a certain topic for a week or a month. And it, it helps to kind of integrate it into daily life too if you're doing that thing over time and you start to notice patterns. Um, you might be, this happens to me all the time, you might be like watching, I don't know, a movie or a TV show or something and you just, you notice in that show the patterns that you're dealing with in your meditation. So, you know, I think it's really great to to use a book like that. 
or to use an online course like that. Um, I want to give a shout out to my um, teachers, my home sangha. Uh, it's called Dawn Mountain. Uh, if you just Google them, um, Dawn Mountain Center for Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, if you Google that, you will definitely find them, but they have, um, you know, courses that they offer. This weekend, they're going to be doing a retreat on the five elements. I think it's going to be really good. You can check it out there, but I'm just, I'm just giving my uh, teachers a shout out here because I think it's really helpful to keep learning. It's like continuing ed, and it helps you to structure that ongoing meditation practice too, so that you're getting new ideas, you're learning new skills, you can see what works for you, what doesn't work for you. You can circle back and see if that thing that didn't work for you two years ago actually is better now. Or I mentioned, I feel like shamatha, calm abiding for me is a real weak point. So that's something that I like to keep coming back to, especially on retreat. Um, and speaking of retreat, I think for me, this is an important part of like long-term meditation practice because if you're able to do a week or a couple of weeks or like even a longer retreat every so often, it really gives the mind time to settle. So the mind just naturally can be clearer, calmer, more able to attend to what's going on. And when that happens, you're just, you're able to kind of experience meditation at a deeper level. And I found that really powerful because then coming back from that longer retreat, you still have those insights that you can now work on and investigate, maybe structure your practice around them for, you know, the next few months until you can do another little, little sh like retreat. I was going to sh say short retreat, but however long you have, some people have a lot of time. Um, so yeah, retreat can be an important part of that long-term um, Dharma practice strategy. Uh, I feel like it's just been me writing stuff in chat for a while. Does anyone else have your own tips or best practices, things that have worked well for you in terms of structuring your longer term meditation practice? And while people are probably typing stuff in chat or at least reflecting on your own practice, I do want to say, partly because it is um, something we're required to do on live sessions, that uh, you are welcome to make a donation. Um, donations help to support Insight Timer, they support us as the teachers, and it's also just a traditional way of cultivating generosity in your practice. So if you would like to do that, that is always super welcome. I also just want to say something is not working with my like teacher dashboard right now so i'm not able to thank people to like send thank you messages to people who donate so i also just want to say thank you to everyone who has donated recently that i've not thanked um so i don't see any other messages in chat does anybody have questions thoughts or anything before we wrap it up And again, while folks are typing stuff in, I just want to let you know, um, I'll post this uh, recording to my, my podcast, Buddhist Wisdom Modern Life. Um, I also have a YouTube channel. It'll go there too. Um, and you're welcome to join uh, my circle here on Insight Timer, which is called Buddhist Wisdom Modern Life. And, um, you know, we can continue the conversation. I'll be dropping songs, you know, by about Guru Rinpoche uh, there when I remember them. <laughs> uh, Logan says, I also set a timer every hour, one, to like as a, remind, a reminder for mindfulness and also two, to recite things I try to memorize like the five remembrances. That is so good. Memorization and recitation is a really traditional part of Buddhism. Uh, it's been called a religion of lists, which makes it easier to memorize because traditionally Buddhist texts weren't written down. Um, so you need a list to remember like, okay, <laughs> there's eight points. I've only listed six. There's two more that I have to go. Yeah, so I think this topic is really important. Um, you know, meditation is not just what happens in one session. It's also how do you make that part of your life? How do you keep it fresh, you know, hopefully year after year as you're continuing to train your mind and explore your mind and just 
you know, see more clearly, get more aligned with the way reality actually works.